Their rough and tumble touring life did nothing to slow Metallica down. And in the spring of 1986, the band released its third album, Master of Puppets. It sold a million copies without the benefit of a radio single or music video. Metallica toured for six months with Ozzy Osbourne. It would be their last as a supporting act. They really give me a run for my money every night. The crowd were going nuts for them, you know, stealing the show most of the night. They were really hard to follow. On tour, Metallica indulged in classic rock and roll excess. And when you're 22 years old and all you want to do is get laid and get drunk and live all those excesses that you hear about or read about, and all of a sudden they're right in front of you. We'd come right off stage into the showers and there'd be, you know, a whole locker room shower filled with women. I mean, how great is that? That happened. Plenty. Tub tarts. Shower. Eight women washing you down at once, you know? Not a bad feeling. <laughs> you have a real sense of invulnerability when you're on tour because you're with this group of people, you know, a group of guys, and you really become, seriously, you feel like Superman. You're on this bus, nothing can touch you. But Metallica's wild ride would soon come crashing to a halt. On September 27, 1986, the band was traveling by bus on the road between Stockholm and Copenhagen. On that European tour, you know, we had a really bad bus. These particular buses weren't purpose-built that we have now. They have normal windows like a passenger coach, and the bunks are just bolted in. Then they put cardboard over the windows. Earlier that night, a friendly dispute between Kirk and Cliff over sleeping arrangements concluded with a draw of cards. The first card that Cliff picked was the Ace of Spades, and he looked at me and said, I want your bunk. And I said, fine, you take my bunk, I'll sleep up front. That's probably better anyway, you know. <laughs> Later on that night, at about five or six in the morning, I heard a skidding, I heard a vibration, and then this, this motion. I thought we were going off a cliff. He overcorrected to get back onto the road. And as he did, the back end came around this way, and it started chomp, chomp, chomp. It's the sound of screeching brakes and uh, being flipped around like a piece of clothes in a dryer. Just got woke up, like hot coffee getting poured all over me, you know, from the, the coffee machine. And, you know, the bus was on its side. What happened? Is the bus going to blow up? Well, I jumped out of the bus and took off. Did the 100 yard dash in about seven seconds flat. And we're standing out there in our underwear and, you know, 10 below. And I heard everyone screaming except for Cliff. And I thought, oh my God, something's wrong. Seeing the bus driver just, you know, freaking frantic. And I turned around and I saw Cliff's legs sticking out from underneath the bus. I went to, you know, pull him out, wake him up or whatever. It's like, you know, he's not moving. And the driver walked over and started pulling on the on the blanket that was under the, underneath the bus next to Cliff. And I said, what are you doing? I grabbed him and said, don't you take that away from him. Against all odds, the band hoped that somehow, some way, Cliff could be saved. A crane turned up, a big crane with a jib and all that, and they hooked up a chain around the bus. And they picked the bus up. There's still people trapped under the bus, but everyone else is okay. I don't know if Cliff was dead at this point or not, because the bus actually slipped back after they picked it up. They lifted it to pull him out and it slipped back and landed again on the floor. After that, it, it, you know, I was in such shock that everything else for the next three or four hours, I, cannot, I can't even remember. Kirk and James yelling at the driver. What did you do? What did you do? What happened? You know, what's going on? You know, is this guy drunk or la la la? Oh, we hit some black ice. And I recall in my underwear, you know, and socks, walking for miles, looking for this black ice, walking back on. Where's this black ice? I don't see any black ice. And I wanted to kill this guy. I was going to, I was going to end him there. Early Saturday morning, September 27th, 1986, on the road near Jungby, Sweden, Cliff Burton died. He was 24 years old. He just got thrown out the window and boom, the bus landed on him. And basically, by all accounts, I mean, he never woke up. You know, to this day, I just, I just think, you know, it could have been me, it, could have, it couldn't have been me, but it's, it's never left me to this day. You always feel protected on tour. Nothing bad can happen like this. It's not allowed. You know what I mean? This is rock and roll, man. Nobody dies. 
but they do, and it had happened, and it was hard to grasp us. Drinkers we were. We went back to the hotel and just drank, 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 you know. I remember at 4 o'clock in the morning, I could hear James down on the street, drunk, screaming, Cliff, Cliff, where are you? And when I heard that, I just, you know, I just broke into tears, you know. Within hours, news of Cliff's death reached Metallica's fans in America. One such fan was Flotsam and Jetsam bassist Jason Newstead. I remember tears hitting the newspaper, killed in Sweden, Metallica bassist Cliff Burton, 24 years old or whatever, and I'm just... <laughs> just lost it. Lars, James, and Kirk returned to San Francisco to attend the funeral of their friend and bandmate. Lars took over from then on. And, you know, in all fairness to Lars, without Lars Ulrich, that band wouldn't be where they are today. With the added pressure of a Japanese tour scheduled to begin within a month, the band auditioned 40 prospective bassists in San Francisco. I can remember those, those auditions just being really, really bad because we, we were drinking throughout the whole thing. We were still grieving, obviously. We tried out quite a few people. Uh, Les Claypool from Primus was actually one of them. Lars was all, you're not used to playing this kind of music, are you? And I was like, no, hey, you know, you guys want to jam on some Isley Brothers tunes, you know, and uh, nobody, nobody laughed at my joke. He was too good. He was like, okay, you got your own thing, you know. They never called me. I weeped. Weeped, weeped like, a, like, a, like a little girl. Well, a guy would come in that just didn't look right or whatever, plug the bass in for 20 seconds, do, 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 next. I mean, it was cold, and I'm just going a whole, I was shaking in my boots. Jason, we thought, was the man. Kind of the punter vibe, but he had the energy that we were looking for. We sat down and we decided he's going to be the guy, so we took him to this place, Tommy's Joint in San Francisco, where we kind of liked to hang, and took him out to grub, and Lars and I went in the bathroom to piss together, and it's like, let's go tell him now, okay. Lars comes out, do you want a job? And I go, nah, I guess. And he goes... Okay, hey, you're gonna be bass roadie. And I'm like, F her. you know, <laughs> like and he goes, no, you got it, man. You're in. You wanna play with us? And I'm like, Sha! Jason's jumping off the table and doing backflips and all this stuff. It's like, okay, all right, man, you know. Um, but soon after that was the the hazing. We gave him a pretty tough time because we we didn't want him to think that he just like waltzed into a perfect situation, you know. And then when a period of calm hits, that's when the reality starts setting in. And then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. And then the emotions start coming out. You know, I hate to say this, but Jason became the scapegoat for, for you know, the tragic loss that we had just experienced with Cliff. With the specter of Cliff Burton's death hanging over the band, they embarked for Japan in the fall of 1986. But for Metallica and their new bass player, the transition was a hard one. We were all trying to see his his boiling point, you know, or how much he can take, you know. We told everyone he was gay. We would go out to the hotel bar and, like, buy drinks for everyone and charge it to Jason's room. And then we went to sushi that night. Jace, that green stuff, it's mint sauce. Put some of that, you'll love it. Wasabi. But he kept walking into every single landmine and every single trap we set for him. And that just made it more and more fun. Part of loving him means that... That he has to accept us for who we are, which is not easy. I mean, everyone thinks, wow, this guy's landed the greatest gig, etc. On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, think of all the baggage that he's got to plow through, plus he's got those three. <laughs>